Hello there. My name is Professor Fran Boyle and I'm a medical oncologist in Sydney, Australia. I'm the director of the Patricia Ritchie Centre for Cancer Care and Research at the Mater Hospital and I also work at the University of Sydney in research and teaching. And one of the areas that I work in uh, is teaching medical communication. So I'm very interested in today's topic, which is shared decision making. I'm joined for our discussion today by Professor uh, Dr. Khatija Lim Abdullah, a professor of nursing at Sunway University in Selangor, Malaysia, and Ms. Evelyn Ong, who's a breast cancer survivor from Singapore in the Republic of Singapore. Uh, thank you for joining us, ladies. And the section we will be uh, dealing with today is what is, to say, what is shared decision making uh, and what elements are essential to its success in patients uh, with early breast cancer. The key elements of uh, success in shared decision making in early breast cancer uh, include recognising that patients come from different backgrounds and adapting our own communication to what works for them. The sorts of things that are very important are that the information we give is clear and accurate, but also unbiased. And this is where sometimes the second opinion about treatment can be very helpful to patients. That communication of evidence also needs to address what the patient needs to hear. And that might be different from what we think they need to know. Also including their preferences, values and needs, which might depend on their family circumstances, religious views, cultural preferences. So why does it matter? Well, there are lots of choices in early breast cancer treatment. Early breast cancer can be treated with systemic therapy before or after surgery. The surgical decisions can include mastectomy or lumpectomy, uh, a sentinel node biopsy or an auxiliary dissection, uh, reconstruction in various different kinds. And there are also a number of different post-surgical treatments, radiotherapy and endocrine therapy, about which choices can be made. And this is where the multidisciplinary team uh, need to communicate well uh, with one another, but also with the patient to ensure that nothing is missed on that long and sometimes quite tortuous journey. So when we think about this, uh, this long journey of breast cancer treatment, most important is the perception of the woman, the patient, and her risk of cancer recurrence, uh, her risk of getting new cancers, and how she perceives the different treatment options can help her. And I know this is something, Evelyn, you've had to wrestle with uh, in real life. Would you mind telling us uh, a little bit about your story? Sure. I will share a little bit of my background um, as well as um, the journey of my breast cancer treatment. Um, I was diagnosed with stage 2 breast cancer in October 2017, um, and I discovered it through self-examination, although I do go for my annual mammogram. Um, it was on the left, very close to my armpit, and if I did not lift up, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't even feel the tumor. Um, and it was stage two because the means not closest to it was uh, was positive. So as uh, you rightfully uh, pointed out, uh, there were a lot of decisions to be made. Right from the point where the lump was discovered, um, um, initially I have to see the uh, breast doctor. Um, she's the one who sent me for radiologies, mammogram, ultrasound, um, and uh, a, a biopsy as well. Um, once that is positive and it's confirmed that it's a triple positive, um, then everything falls into place, right? Then I'll have to find an oncologist um, who's going to do more tests to determine the staging. And um, the, the breast doctor also explained to me what are the different options. Um, what are the uh, success chances? What's my prognosis of someone with a triple positive breast cancer as well as someone of my age? Um, so there was a lot of information to absorb um, right from the beginning. So um, a lot of decisions to be made. Um, the, the first major decision that uh, I have to think of was uh, whether I want to go for adjuvant or a neoadjuvant treatment. Um, and of course, 
there are pros and cons of each option. Um, and it also, it, the, the decision was uh, further complicated with uh, one of my family members because I have a brother-in-law who's a doctor, uh, but he's not an oncologist, he's a, he's a general practitioner. Um, and, you know, his experience, his education was from 20, 30 years ago. And at that time, the prescribed treatment was to go for surgery first. Like what he, the word he used to describe was remove the mothership and then use chemo to mop up all the cancer itself. But that is very different from what my breast doctor and my oncology say today. And they are saying that, no, that's actually not what is being recommended these days. Um, we usually recommend uh, the patient to go to chemotherapy first so that you are able to tell how responsive the patient is to the treatment and then before you, can, before you go for the surgery. So that, was, uh, that, that to me in the entire journey was the major decision. There are also a little very small decision that uh, I have to decide as well. So things that doesn't seem like a big deal in the entire treatment, um, there is actually every, every point of it is a decision point that me as the patient has to make. And at those points, uh, no doubt, Evelyn, your, your personal preferences were, were critical. And uh, Professor Abdullah, uh, Evelyn has touched on something really important here, which is the role of family members in uh, helping or maybe hindering even decision making. And is this something that from a nursing perspective, you feel uh, is really critical? We understand that need to engage with family members as well. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Professor Friend. Uh, absolutely, uh, because especially in the Asian culture, we have what we call the cultural collectivism, where you know we really put family harmony as a very important uh, component in whatever we do. So whatever decisions the patients tends to want to make, they tends to want to involve the family members. So that may include not only their husband, but their brothers, their sisters, their in-laws. So uh, in that aspect, when we talk about sharing decision-making with the patient, uh, we have to extend it and involve these family members so that there's no sort of conflict at the end of the day in whether to follow the doctor or to follow the family. So I, I really can uh, sort of agree with Evelyn's situation where the brother says something that is very different from the healthcare pers uh, professionals, really. And Evelyn, I also wanted to ask you, um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Abdullah, how much the nurses were helpful to you in helping sort out those decisions? I'm thinking particularly about the decision about uh, mastectomy and reconstruction? Uh, well, for that particular decision, it was purely um, my own decision. I, of course, hear the perspectives from different people, including my care team. The minimum that they can accept is, uh, is a single mastectomy. I think lumpectomy was not an option for me. So it's just, uh, it's just a decision of whether I should go for a single uh, or a double. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, again, a lot of research, a lot of um, weighing the pros and cons of advice and recommendations given by um, the oncologist, the breast doctor, as well as the plastic surgeon. Uh, thank you, Evelyn. And it sounds like someone uh, you're someone who's a very um, uh, good decision maker in terms of, of weighing up uh, the different pieces of information that you're given. And we know that some people are very um, used, in fact, before they even get breast cancer, to weighing up data, weighing up evidence, and thinking that through slowly uh, with the help of their team. And uh, we call those people theorists, and you often find them in, in jobs that require research or teaching, uh, use of data, for instance. And uh, that's where having very, very clear explanations, uh, particularly without jargon, as you mentioned, uh, can be most useful. 
different kinds of patients come in uh, the uh, category we call reflectors, and this is based on the work of Honey and Mumford. And they're the people who uh, have strong feelings about uh, what's happening to them and like to take a lot of time in decision making. Other women fall into uh, a category uh, we would call pragmatists. So they realise there's a job to be done. They just want to get on with it as fast as possible and to minimise interruption. And so sometimes what might motivate them to uh, a second mastectomy uh, is just that, you know, I never want to have chemotherapy again. I want to be done with this. And there's a fourth group of patients that uh, we might refer to as activists. And they're the people who are very strongly influenced by the relationship they might have with their healthcare team and uh, very much feel the need for trust uh, to develop with the people giving them advice. And they may be much less interested in the data they're much uh, less interested in why it's happening, but they're very interested in who's going to be with them on this complicated journey. Now, of course, uh, doctors come in all those categories as well, uh, but sometimes there's a mismatch uh, between the way the patient might wish to make decisions and the way the healthcare uh, professionals feel uh, things need to be done. And in particular, if they need to be done quickly, uh, that may be more difficult for some kinds of patients than others. So uh, I don't know, uh, Professor Abdullah, whether you've noticed um, some people are much more interested in the data and others have no interest in it and they just want it sorted. Yes, um, absolutely true, actually, because um, each one of them have maybe very different learning styles. And when we talk about shared decision making, we, we need to ensure that they understand the information and that is how they can make a decision. Um, but however, in certain cultures, understanding doesn't mean that they can act on it. And that is where the, the, the what do you call it, the context of it is also equally important, uh, especially in Malaysia, where the religion itself got a very, very, uh, what should I say, uh, a very, very strong influence in the, uh, what they decide to do, despite having the knowledge. I mean, we have cases where, you know, women come to us with very late uh, what do you call it, onset of breast cancer. And one of the things that they sort of say is that they knew they had something wrong, but they're praying hard that it is not what they think it is. So they suddenly covered it until it was too painful Then they come to us. So that is where the shared decision-making sometimes is very difficult because basically when they came to us, it was like very late onset, so the shared decision making have to occur where it is early onset and they have more choices and more informed decision. Uh, when it comes to us like in stage four, really to be honest, there's really nothing, not much choice really for them. The area where religion most likely occurs is in that group of patients who have a very reflective background mm -hmm. and uh, where the uh, diagnosis of breast cancer as a, a challenge or even a punishment uh, yes. may be something that is perceived. And uh, we see that uh, in Australia in patients who have uh, a great adherence to uh, alternative therapies and where they perceive the toxicity of Western medicine. And uh, you see that in breast cancer as well. So people who want to fix why they have breast cancer rather than going, I don't know why I've got it, just fix it for me, uh, which sounds like Evelyn's, <laughs> Evelyn's approach. <laughs> and so you're right, if you can't understand what that background is uh, for someone with a reflective space, it's very hard to get them. So thank you both very much uh, for your input about how things might be different in different parts of the world. And uh, we will hear more on this topic shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Professor Dr. Khatija Lim Abdullah, and I am a professor of nursing at Sunway University in Malaysia. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce my panelists who is actually joining us in this very exciting session, Professor Francis Boyle, Professor of Medical Oncology and Director of the Patricia Richards Center for Cancer Care and Research at the University of Sydney in Australia, and the distinguished professor, Dr. Michael Nutt, Professor of Surgery at the Medical University of Vienna in Austria. So in this session, we are going to look at what is the evidence or is there any evidence for the effect that shared decision-making has on patient outcome in early breast cancer patients. So there has been actually a field of literatures that talk about you know, using shared decision-making in managing patient. And that has actually shown some moderately positive effect. However, there is no conclusive evidence as yet to really conclusively say that it is a, a what you call very effective in terms of outcome. So with me, I, I mean, uh, I would like to ask uh, Professor Boyle, what is her own opinion about some of the effect of shared decision making on the patient that she see in her clinical practice? Professor Boyle? Thank you, Professor Abdullah. So I work in a part of Sydney, Australia, where um, patients are generally well-educated. They come from a variety of uh, cultural backgrounds. But some of our work has shown that just having a choice uh, does help women's quality of life and it does help uh, their body image uh, recovery after breast cancer. And there are many uh, things that insult women's uh, quality of life and body image and some of them uh, there is not a lot of choice about if survival is their top priority which of course is is for many women uh, but things like uh, to have a reconstruction or not uh, to do scalp cooling to prevent hair loss uh, or not uh, to have a mastectomy to avoid radiation uh, depending on what your greatest concerns about lymphedema might be and so we know that women fear different things uh, survival of course being uh, one but not the only one and some uh, women fear changes to their body image uh, well above uh, what one might expect and one has to take that seriously in assisting with decision making. My second question is really is looking into in your opinion, is there a method that will quantitatively measure the effect of SDM? Because currently there's a lot of uh, papers that really are not rigorously carried out that actually indicate that you know, SDM is the way to go forward when we are offering choice to patients with diverse options you know, that, that can be, they can choose from. So, uh, Professor Boy, your opinion, please. Uh, you rightly point, Katija, to um, the need for good methodology in studies such as this. And the sorts of tools that we've used are things like decisional regret, so uh, decisional conflict, do I wish I'd made a different decision? But the other things that are important are fear of recurrence, and we know that that is uh, an impact on quality of life for many patients. And the, there is no definite correlation between the actual risk of recurrence and the fear of recurrence. And uh, research done here in Sydney has shown uh, that, uh, that some women actually need help from a psychologist in the sort of way that you would uh, have treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder, for instance about the whole cancer experience. And that is not just women who have a high risk of recurrence, it can be it can be any women um, and is associated with anxiety and depression. So those are both things that we also need uh, to be measuring, anxiety and depression. We know they're common in breast cancer survivors. And what we know less about uh, is the impact of shared decision-making on doctors and nurses. So uh, 
uh, you know, the time spent engaged in shared decision making uh, can seem laborious, uh, but is often time well spent if that leads to a better treatment. Rightly so. I think basically, um, if you even have the patients willing to do SDM, you also need to have the health professionals who's willing to give it, right? So that, that is very spot on, really. Thank you so much, Professor Boyd. Um, Professor Michael Nutt, I was just wondering, from your aspects of being a surgeon, what is your opinion on you know, using SDM, uh, whether it meets patient needs or not? Well, you know, I think the the issue we face uh, when we discuss the available evidence is that um, philosoph philosophically or strategically, probably almost everyone would agree that SDM is the way to go. It's, however, much more difficult to really prove in terms of uh, reliable endpoints, in yes. terms of true clinical research. There has been uh, quite a lot um, of attempts in the literature, including some beautiful work by yourself, to pin this down. So I believe what I would wish for is that um, we have more uh, research pinning down the actual effect on outcome. I'm utterly convinced, and that's my professional life experience, that decisions about particularly about surgical strategies, uh, including breast conservation or mastectomy, including neoadjuvant systemic treatment or primary surgery, they are much more reliable. There's much less post-decisional regret if you get it right in terms of shared decision-making. But in terms of the hard evidence, I think we need to improve a little bit in order to show that this is actually beneficial for patients and eventually also for caregivers. I think that's um, that's what exactly the situation is. Is actually to to prove black and white that it is effective and it's so so difficult because it is a psychological well being that actually people get from when they actually have a power to make a decision. I think this empowerment in decision making is something that is so difficult to measure. Professor Nutt, uh, maybe I should ask you, is that, you know, some of those evidence actually demonstrated that, you know, the, the SDM seems to actually reduce decisional conflict. What is your take on it, uh, Professor Nutt? Do, do you think actually the SDM will help to reduce decisional conflict? I, I absolutely agree. I think there is some uh, reliable evidence, particularly from the field of metastatic breast cancer. It's a, bit, a little bit less uh, clear in early breast cancer, but there is quite a number of reports on, um, for example, visualization uh, tools for magnitude of difference. What does this mean? Like a hazard ratio of 0.9. Uh, which I think needs to be explained to patients. And there is uh, some excellent tools um, that have been developed uh, in order to uh, uh, aid patients in the communication they need to have uh, with uh, their, their caregivers. Um, and, and obviously, uh, it's, it's not so easy to measure um, the, that eventually in terms of outcome, this is better. But, you know, everybody who tries to uh, involve him or herself into SDM will, will report that, um, you know, this is, this is uh, advantageous for both patients and, and physicians um, alike. Uh, Professor Boyle, may I ask you, uh, you know, this information needs, uh, do you think that um, there is evidence in the SDM that shows that it can fulfill patient information needs uh, totally. What do you think about that? I think the decisions about treatment in breast cancer evolve for most women over a period of time. They're not all made on day one and they're not all made by one member of the multidisciplinary team. And for that reason, we need to think about revisiting the decisions that are made as, as time passes, uh, patients' needs will evolve. And sometimes they say, uh, you know, I'm glad I didn't know that at the beginning, 
when it's something you very clearly have told them. Um, or I'm, I couldn't hear at the beginning anymore about what you were all trying to tell me. I just had to take a day at a time. And now that I am completed my chemotherapy and my surgery and my radiotherapy, I'm ready to hear about endocrine therapy. But if you had laid this on me at the beginning, I'd have probably just, you know, exploded. And so the idea that uh, we can communicate to patients is there's a kind of timeline here and you don't have to, you know, preload every decision at the beginning, that things will evolve and actually our knowledge evolves and uh, the evidence evolves. A, a year is a long time in the breast cancer scientific world and we will know more in a year than we know now. And that's so true. that sometimes just prefacing your remarks with, you know, not everything has to be decided today can help people to feel less panicky. So, so important and relevant because, uh, you know, the, uh, the patient journey can actually differ accordingly to the time and the contacts and what are they exposed to and how they're dealt with during that journey, actually. So um, basically in breast cancer, that maybe do you agree to that? That's one of the reasons why in SDM to say that we need to measure it in a very quantitative way might not be the best way to see the effect of SDM. It might also be better to actually look at it in another perspective in terms of their psychological well-being, in terms of what they can get at the end of it. I also think uh, trust is a very important uh, aspect of this story. Trust in the team, trust that your questions will be answered honestly. And there are some good scales actually developed in the Netherlands for, you know, trust in oncology. And I think that's a relevant outcome for uh, the team. The other thing that we learned uh, early in an uh, research at Sydney Uni was just prompting patients to ask more questions and yes. just giving them a sheet of questions. To, you know, people with cancer often ask these questions, increase the likelihood that they would ask questions about prognosis, which we all think is important. And uh, it also, if the oncologist addressed that list that the patient had brought with them to the consultation, it not only helped the patient to feel satisfied uh, and less anxious, it also shortened their consultation time. And like that, you rightly said so, in different journey, they have different needs. And that is where we need to ask them to tell us what are the things they need an answer to. So thank you so much, Prof. Ball, and also Professor Nat for sharing your opinion and thoughts on the evidence for shared decision making. Thank you. Hello, my name is Michael Grant. I'm a professor of surgery at the Medical University of Vienna in Vienna, Austria. And I'm joined today by Professor Fran Boyle, professor of medical oncology and director of the Patricia Ricci Center for Cancer Care and Research at the University of Sydney in Australia. And by Ms. Evelyn Ong, who is a breast cancer survivor from Singapore and Republic of Singapore. In this section, we will discuss the question, what are the challenges around implementing shared decision-making for patients with early breast cancer and how they can be overcome? Uh, so thank you to both of you for joining me in this program. Obviously, we have challenges that are in the system on the side of the caregivers. But we might also face challenges for shared decision-making from a patient's uh, perspective, cultural background and everything. Uh, and this is why I would uh, like to start uh, with Evelyn, who actually has produced a number of excellent YouTube videos uh, that I watched. And I have to say that this is so important and brave to come out and to encourage fellow patients uh, with your own story. But maybe focusing on the challenges for shared decision-making 
what in your view are the main uh, restrictions and hinderings and challenges from a perspective of the patient, of patient's family, maybe cultural or even religious background. Can you share your thoughts on this with us, Evelyn? Sure, I'll, I'll share uh, my story. Um, well, as you understand, the entire uh, cancer treatment involves a lot of many clinicians. And I do not have a, in my corporate world what we call a project manager to sort of manage just the entire treatment plan. Um, the patient, for, from, from my experience, the patient is the one who takes on this role to understand what each different clinician um, has to say, the information that they provide, and then ultimately use this um, information that's provided to make an informed decision. Um, and um, this is a big group of people. Um, um, in my entire journey, I have to uh, see uh, my breast surgeon, my oncologist, my uh, cardiologist, my gynecologist. Um, I also have an infectious disease doctor because I developed shingles. Um, I have plastic surgeon because of my mastectomy and uh, reconstruction. I have my oncologist nurses, physio physiotherapist, as well as an a and &E doctor. So everyone has a different role to play in my entire journey. And sometimes it's challenging because um, not everyone talks to each other. So when that happens, there is a mismatch or rather they have to re-explain the entire situation um, to, the, to the, the other doctor in order um, for them to decide on the best care treatment for me. Well, thank you, Evelyn, for sharing your experience. I think that's one of the, one of the challenges we face that sometimes the patient is actually used as the as the reporting vehicle uh, between doctors. Um, Professor Boyle, what can be you have uh, done also uh, quite some research in the field and uh, you're using uh, patient uh, decision aiding tools. Um, what are your what are the barriers um, you have experienced or you think are most important on the caregiver side to implement shared decision making as a standard of care? Uh, thanks very much, Michael. And yes, we uh, we have some experience uh, with one of my uh, oncology colleagues uh, who piloted, tested, and uh, has now made available online a decision aid for women considering neoadjuvant therapy uh, ahead of their surgery. And uh, what we identified with that was that we needed to present the information in lots of different ways. So in writing, uh, through graphs and uh, through uh, pictorial representations. Some people are visual learners. Some people are used to processing lots of text. Uh, and also to have the opportunity to have a decision aid available in a paper version that you could actually hand to a patient or in an online version, which is now um, available to anyone to use. When we looked at uh, the impact uh, of the patients, how had they actually used that information, many of them said, uh, they used it for uh, discussing with their families why they were choosing something that was kind of countercultural, which is surgery not first, as Evelyn's experience, uh, drug treatment first, yeah, because, you know, people trained 20 years ago, no, that's wrong. And uh, that was something that was critical. And the other really critical factor, uh, the project manager, if you like, uh, that we use in Australia is the dedicated breast care nurses. Thanks, Ren. I, I believe that's that's probably one of the important role models. Um, so I think implementing breast care nurses is uh, probably one of the one of the uh, cornerstones in overcoming some of the challenges that also Evelyn uh, has faced. In terms of outcome, Evelyn, if I, I may ask, um, uh, if I understand you eventually opted for mastectomy. Would you, would you share your experience with what difference it made for you that you basically took the decision yourself after an information process? And I would assume it was not a decision made from one day to the next. It might have taken some time. Right. So um, because uh, it has spread to the lymph node, um, lumpectomy was not really an option. So the advice given to me was 
um, uh, mastectomy, but I have a choice of doing it uh, just one side or both sides. Um, I decided to go for both sides um, because uh, the other side also has uh, abnormal cells. It's not cancerous yet, but it's definitely not normal cells. Um, so the advice given was from, from the best breast surgeon and approved or agreed by the oncologist is that it would be better for me in the long term. Um, and also consideration that I'm still fairly young to have it both removed so that I do not have to, um, you know, there's a possibility that it, 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 will, it will relapse. So, so that, it, um, that shared decision between uh, myself um, the oncologist and the breast surgeon was uh, was uh, it was a joint effort, and I'm I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, of course, the plastic surgeon came into the picture eventually because he will have to um, do the reconstruction. But would you would you say that you know having empowered yourself and uh, participated in that shared decision making process actually was of yell of of value in terms of not looking back in regret? Uh, absolutely. I, 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 as a patient and as my body, um, I definitely appreciate that um, all the facts were given to me and I was able to make the best decision um, based on my comfort level and what uh, I will have to live with. But the empowerment, the, um, the empowerment, the, the, uh, the option that I have and uh, the, the and the open communication opportunity that I have with uh, different people is definitely uh, very uh, useful for me. On the caregiver side, there are obvious uh, barriers to shared decision making in terms of uh, training, in terms of uh, physicians' time, resources available, um, maybe access to some uh, helpful tools. Uh, Professor Boyle, uh, can you tell us your experience with that uh, and and with these uh, decision aids, uh, uh, how can they be helpful and how can we implement them uh, more broadly? Uh, thanks, Michael. And uh, I'd just like to draw some attention to the work of um, Dr. Nick Zinkowski from Australia. And uh, he has uh, looked at the different ways we can present information about things like risk and benefit uh, using tools such as 100 person diagrams or uh, the 100 dots or a thousand dots if it's a rare side effect and also uh, a way of actually helping women to weigh up uh, the different choices in terms of their own preferences Having those available on paper is great, but having them available online is even better. And uh, that neoadjuvant systemic therapy guide is now available online at myneoguide.com. And uh, what that showed uh, in his research was that reduce, uh, reduced decisional regret. Uh, it helped uh, patient quality of life and it didn't importantly increase anxiety. Other very simple things you can do, just a question prompt list. You can make that up yourself uh, with the team. You can use uh, ones that are available online. And we know that they also help uh, to reduce patient anxiety. Okay, thank you very much. So maybe in closing this segment, Fran, uh, let's touch on, on what I always believe a kind of a delicate subject. I mean, we, we have scientific evidence about many uh, many aspects of uh, breast cancer treatment. And what, in my experience, usually patients overestimate the risk, but they sometimes also overestimate the benefits of treatments we propose to them. So now, is there a difference between accepting patients' choice, even if it's wrong, or feeling the obligation, scientifically wrong, feeling the obligation to inform, to educate by using SDM methodology, or would that be an overly patronizing approach? Uh, no, and I can say this as a menopausal woman who doesn't have breast cancer, uh, I have experienced almost everything that people ascribe to their endocrine therapy. And so women are asked to come and see me when they don't want to do what somebody else wants them to do. And usually that is around endocrine therapy because it's the thing that goes on, you know, 
a long time. But um, it's it's putting yourself in that person's shoes if you can possibly do that and uh, really just uh, listening, asking lots of questions, making sure you understand and then saying, you know, there's more than one way to do this. I want to want one more comment, uh, if you don't mind, uh, based on something Evelyn said. Uh, as well as breast care nurses, we found that having consumers who have been through the experience of breast cancer before, particularly around things like reconstruction, and are willing to talk to newly diagnosed women is extremely helpful. And I have a patient recently who had a BRCA2 mutation who really should have had other traumastectomies technically years ago when she had her first triple negative breast cancer but wouldn't and when she got her second triple negative breast cancer it was on our agenda of course you know you don't want to do this again uh, and it was only when she was able to talk to a woman who could describe in great detail day one day two day three exactly how it felt uh, that really changed her attitude and she came in the other day extremely happy with how the surgery had gone and uh, that's really another area uh, that you can help resource for patients is consumers who are willing to share their experiences. Mm -hmm. This concludes our segment on challenges around implementing shared decision-making. Thank you very much both uh, to Evelyn and Fran um, for sharing your experience and discussing this with us. Thank Thanks, Michael. <laughs>